Hello there and welcome to what is the 14th Sunday of our socially distanced worship. Can you believe that? 14 Sundays? Uh, you might be watching this on the live stream and if you are, good morning, I'm watching with you. And if you're catching up later on YouTube, it's great that you've tuned in. It's really important that we stay connected to each other as a church family during this time and after 14 weeks uh, we might be kind of forgetting who each other is so it's good that we are staying connected and feeling part of this faith community as best as possible. Uh, so a very warm welcome to you uh, wherever you're tuning in from. I know there are people that tune in from all over the world so that's really great friends and family uh, near and far. Uh, during these services, I like to include as many different people and different voices as possible, mainly from our own church community uh, and from other places. This morning, we, we have someone who is part of our community, part of our family, but who is in ministry in another place, and that's Helen Freeburn. Many of you will know Helen, will have worked with Helen, worshipped with her, laughed and cried with her. Um, Helen is the Presbyterian minister in the Galway congregation. She's been out there now for maybe six, seven years uh, with her husband, Dave. Uh, but Helen is originally a member of Lucan Presbyterian's congregation, and she has never really left us. So one of the great things about this era is that we can bring people in from anywhere in the world for no extra cost, uh, no travel expenses required. So Helen is uh, going to greet us now and then lead us in prayer. And after that, we are going to have some worship. So stick with us, um, enjoy seeing Helen, join in prayer with her, and then let's worship together. Hello everyone in Lucan Presbyterian Church and those of you watching this from around the world. Um, lots of you may know me uh, in Lucan, some of you watching this might not. Uh, myself and Dave uh, send you all though love and greetings from Galway uh, during this strange time that we are all going through. Um, I'm a spiritual daughter of LPC. Lucan Church was our spiritual home for many years. And for many of us, even though we move around and have different homes, LPC, uh, the community, the heart, uh, the love uh, found and felt there, the laughter and tears and friendships shared there, these all stay in our hearts and form part of who we are, uh, no matter where we go. Um, so it's lovely to lead you, my spiritual family, there in prayer today from here. Uh, so thank you, Richard, for asking me to do this. So as one family gathered from all different places, languages and cultures and backgrounds, dispersed but united through Christ Jesus as sisters and brothers of one family of faith, let's continue our time of worship in prayer now. Let's pray. Abba, Father, gracious, loving God, we praise you, we worship you, for you have loved us with an everlasting love and we belong to you, we are yours. You, Lord, are the source of living water, of real love, grace, forgiveness, of real rest and healing, of real strength, peace, joy and faith. You are the giver of real life, new, abundant and eternal life. So we come to you now. At the beginning of time, you moved Holy Spirit over the face of the waters. And you, Lord God, created and brought order, shape, beauty and fruitfulness. Spirit of peace, we ask you to move over this chaotic world and to move over the chaos at times of our lives. And bring your order and beauty and peace. Where life has been difficult this week, where we have felt weak or frustrated, hopeless or directionless, anxious or scared, unable, remind us that your grace is sufficient. You are able. Come Holy Spirit, come, move in a special way now. 
bring us your peace. You, Lord, made a dry way through the sea. You rose Jesus from the tomb. Nothing is impossible with and for you. So give us eyes to see new possibilities this week, new ways forward. You see our hearts, our lives, our worries, our troubles, our challenges that seem so big to us. And you say, do not fear. I am here. I will make a way. I am able. Step out and follow me. We are to love you, Lord, with all that we are and love others as you, Lord Jesus, have loved us. And even though our church buildings are still closed at this time, you are continually calling us to be an open-hearted people, receiving and giving your love and grace. We confess that we can at times close ourselves off from your transforming word and power. Forgive us, O Lord, for our closed mouths that refuse at times to reach out to others with good, encouraging words and the good, good news of Jesus Christ. Forgive our closed eyes, which at times fail to see the needs of others. Forgive us our closed hands that hold on to our wealth and resources at times for ourselves. Forgive our closed hearts that limit, which limit your love for others and for this world. Forgive our closed minds that shut out your spirit for fear that it will disrupt our attitudes and lives. Forgive our divisions and disunity, judgmentalism, criticising and comparing ways and break down the walls of our selfishness. Help us to care for all and for your creation. Thank you that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, that we can know that you who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So thank you, Lord, that you have heard all our prayers and you give us your forgiveness through Christ our Lord and his sacrifice for us on the cross. Come breathe new life, new hope, new love into us this day. Fill us with your powerful presence, we pray. And Spirit of God, grow in us more of your good, good fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness and self-control. Open our eyes to see you more clearly, our hearts to love you more dearly. And may we follow you more nearly. We pray through the powerful and life-giving name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, and our friend in every time of trouble. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to Him. Where steady arms of mercy reach, you have a children in. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. Oh, my days, make the search and 
hope you were singing along with that great hymn at home and thanks to Ruth, Louise, Paul, Ryan and Andrew for joining with me in singing that great hymn of praise that we enjoy singing in LPC. Come people of the risen King and we come together to rejoice uh, in the midst of all of our circumstances and to turn our worship and our praise back to God. So just now we're going to have a children's talk. It's really Dave reading from the Jesus Storybook Bible, but in the way that only Dave can do, where he brings it to life and he's a great storyteller. So I'm going to hand over to Dave and he's going to tell us the story of the Israelites in the wilderness, the manna from heaven and the giving of the Ten Commandments. Thanks, Dave. This is the story story about the children of Israel and I'm reading from the children's storybook Bible. Now the children of Israel were in the desert and they are just gotten out of Egypt and this is called 10 ways to be perfect so there they all were grannies granddads babies uncles aunts children mums and dads out there in the middle of the desert they had blisters from all the walking they were hungry and thirsty and much much too hot We don't like it, they said. It stinks. And so did they, for that matter. Because no one had taken a bath in weeks. Now remember, because this is something they'd forgotten. God had done amazing things for his people. He'd hidden them inside a cloud. He'd moved the sea. He'd set them free. But God's people still weren't happy. They didn't care about being free. Wasn't it better when they were slaves? At least they had lots of food to eat. God doesn't want us to be happy, they said. It was the same lie that Adam and Eve had heard all those years before. God has brought us out here to kill us. God doesn't love us. But they didn't know God very well, did they? Every day of their journey, God kept on showing his people how well he would look after them if they would trust him and obey him. When they were hungry, God made the sky rain with food, bread coming down from heaven. What is it? They asked each other. They didn't know, so they called it, what is it? Which, of course, is a very good name for something when you don't know what it is. When they were thirsty and started quarreling, God made water flow from a rock. Moses called the place quarreling because that seemed like a good name too. And still God's children didn't trust him or do what he said. They thought they could do a better job of looking after themselves and making themselves happy. But God knew there was no such thing as happiness without him. So God led them to a tall mountain. God wanted to talk to his people and show them what he was like. He wanted to help them to know him better and tell them about the special land he was going to give them. The whole earth belongs to me, God said, but I have chosen you. 
You are my special family. I want you to live in a way that shows everyone else what I'm like. So they can know me too. God called Moses up the mountain. The great mountain shook. Lightning crackled. And God gave Moses ten rules called commandments. I want you to love me more than anything else in all the world. And know that I love you too, God told him. That's the most important thing of all. You are the bread of life You are the bread of life He who comes to me will never go hungry He who believes in me will never be thirsty You are the bread Jesus, you are the bread of life. You are the bread of life. You are the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty you are the bread of life Jesus you are the bread of life this is my body that was broken this is my blood that was shed for you Take it and eat and drink it Remember me You are the bread of life You are the bread comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty you are the bread of life Jesus you are the bread of life You are the bread of life You are the bread of life He who comes to me Will never go hungry He who believes in me Will never be thirsty You are the bread The manna from heaven and the water from a rock were miraculous provisions of God for his people as they wandered around the wilderness waiting to enter into their promised land after they had been delivered from slavery. Manna was so important to them and represented so much. And in the New Testament, as recorded as Jesus saying in John's Gospel, that the people might have looked for a sign and God gave manna from heaven. But Jesus declares that he himself is the bread of life. And if we come to him, 
then we'll never go hungry again, for he is the great satisfier. So we're going to have two Bible passages read to us now. First of all, from Emmanuel, and he's reading from Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And then from Tina, who's going to read from John's Gospel, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. This is a reading from Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his only people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek and pursue it. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. This reading is from John chapter 6, verses 25 to 35. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. Now imagine the scene. It's late at night, about an hour or so from bedtime, and you've got those late night cravings. Uh, What is it that you're craving? It happens to all of us at the best of times. It happens to me at the best of times, never mind when I'm locked in with nothing else to do but go back and forward to the fridge looking for snacks. My late night craving often involves peanut butter. Uh, If I'm being good, I put some peanut butter on a rice cracker. If I'm being slightly not so good, I'll put peanut butter on a slice of toast. And if I'm just losing the run of myself, I'll take a spoon out of the drawer and I'll eat the peanut butter straight from the jar. Um, All I have to say is that the peanut butter on the spoon, watching TV, it tastes great. Great, but it's definitely not good. Not in the volume that I eat it in anyway. We all have cravings. You have your own particular cravings late at night watching TV before bed. There's a great story in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers. Now we didn't have that passage read for us today. But you can open up at Numbers chapter 11 and see the story written there. And it's replicated in other parts of the Old Testament as well. In fact I'd encourage you to read through Numbers 11 and maybe read it in a couple of different versions to get the sense of the story and the depth of the drama. It's full of colour and it's full of meaning. The story itself is set in the wilderness, the same era that Dave read about in the Jesus Storybook Bible. God's people had been delivered out of the hands of the Egyptians, out of slavery, Uh, and into the wilderness before they would come to the promised land. Do you remember the plagues, the ten plagues? And Moses saying to Pharaoh, let my people go. Eventually Pharaoh relented and God brought his people out of slavery, parting the Red Sea, through on dry land, guiding them by cloud and by fire into a place of safety and provision. Freed from captivity into the care of their big, generous and loving God. It was a dream come true for God's people to be delivered in this way. 
And as they move from slavery towards what would be a promised land, a place where they would be truly free with their own land and law and leadership, where they would be free to live as God's holy people, the journey towards that place seemed to take forever. God led them into a wilderness with their leader and successive leaders, and it seemed like they just walked round and round in circles, never quite reaching and fulfilling the promise of this new land. But they were free nonetheless, even though nomads and homeless for most of the time. While they were in this wilderness, their joy at being rescued by God uh, soon turned to grumbling against God. There was joy and celebration at the beginning and then there was grumbling and discontent later. And it seems that God and his provisions for his people in the wilderness just weren't enough for his people. He was being good, he was being faithful, he was being loving and he was providing and he was taking them to a place of promise but that wasn't enough for them. And they started to crave other things. Not in the same way that I crave peanut butter late at night but they certainly were craving something else. God had given them manna every morning so when they opened their tents there was fresh manna which could be turned into pancakes and enjoyed for the course of the day. And then of course there was the miraculous water coming from a rock when Moses struck it with his staff and they had their freedom to enjoy but many of them started to forget. Forget that they were once captives, once prisoners in Egypt and forget that what they really had now was way better than what they were experiencing before. But as they sat there in the wilderness, they remembered the melons and the cucumbers and the garlic that they used to eat when they were in captivity. And that became the thing they started to crave. They weren't satisfied anymore with God's provision. They wanted to go back to the old land of slavery so they could satisfy their cravings. During lockdown, um, I've been doing a lot more home cooking. I, perhaps you've been doing the same. I've been enjoying having the time to make some healthy and filling and really tasty meals, playing around with different ingredients. I've even rediscovered the joy of the humble baked potato and all the various toppings that can be put on it. It's just been great. I've really enjoyed that. But in this past week, when McDonald's reopened, I just started to crave a quarter pounder. So like many others, and don't judge me for this, I decided to join the long queue at the drive through <laughs> sitting for the best part of an hour in order to place my order of this double quarter pounder meal. And I scoffed the whole lot in record time. But of course, the instant gratification of that McDonald's you know, just getting it right into me. I, I was enjoyable for five minutes, but it didn't satisfy me in the least. I was bloated, lethargic, and a short time later I was hungry again. That's what happens when you eat a McDonald's. I abandoned the goodness of my quarantine meals in favour of the cravings of the old way of life. And I can confirm to you right now that for one moment of pleasure, it was not worth it. It wasn't good. And this was the cause of the tension in the Israelite community. They, they looked back at what they had in the old life and they started to imagine what it might taste like, what it might feel like, what it might do for them. And they started to crave that. They were looking back at the old through rose-tinted glasses and forgetting that no satisfaction could be found in that place. We all have a hunger and a craving to be fully satisfied. That's what it is to be human, I think, is to seek deep, permanent satisfaction. But the Bible here tells us that we will never be satisfied, never content, never happy if we crave anything or anyone other than God himself. And I, I know that we can forget how he answered our prayers when we were desperate and calling out to him. We can forget how he once healed us. We can forget how he once sustained us faithfully through dark times. We can forget how he 
blessed us in the past. And we can even minimize the fact that he died for our freedom. So often in the difficult times, we call out to God to be our savior. He saves us, brings us through those times, and then we forget all about it, forget all about him. It's part of our human condition and part of our sinfulness. And so at different times in our lives, we have a tendency to minimize God. Yeah, there are times when we call on God and bring him front and center and call out to him. But often we minimize him and reduce him to something that we do on a Sunday, if at all. We give a social media like to a Bible verse or reduce our faith to weak sentimentality, texting people saying that we're thinking and praying for them when really we're not. Often we can forget what it is to have God at the centre of our lives or more dangerously we can push him out because we don't have time for him. We just want to crave other things and get instant satisfaction or gratification. It's like God becomes no longer enough for us. We want to take it into our own hands and find ways that we can satisfy ourselves. If the Israelites in the wilderness were craving the food of captivity and looking back through rose-tinted glasses, then what might we be craving after today when God is out of the picture? Perhaps it's acclaim or notoriety. We want to be renowned for something or recognised for something. Approval from our peers or our colleagues. Perhaps it's on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, where we want to get likes and shares and retweets of our perfect lives in order to build up our sense of self-worth or become TikTok famous like so many people have been doing during the quarantine. Showing off for people who we want to impress. Perhaps in a sexual way we want to sleep around or have an all too casual approach to online pornography. Maybe in a more serene way, having the best garden in the street or looking for the next big holiday to show off about. We even need to be aware that as we pursue good things, they too can become God things if God is pushed out. All of this is a craving. It's a craving for things in our lives that are okay, perhaps, at times, but not good. A craving for things that give us an instant sense of something, a dopamine hit, instant gratification, but definitely not satisfying. And if we push God out, which is our tendency then these other things and these other cravings become our God or our gods. I was once given a definition of greed that I've never forgotten. A pastor friend of mine said that greed, which is associated so much with craving, I suppose, that greed is of course defined as wanting too much of something. So wanting lots and lots and lots of something that's being greedy, but it's also wanting something too much. Perhaps seeing something that we like, something that we want, and wanting it too much that it becomes all-consuming. It takes over our lives and our thoughts and our speech. Wanting too much of something, wanting something too much, and greed is also wanting a right thing at a wrong time, getting things in the wrong order in life, jumping over different stages of life in order to have what we want right now, even if that thing we want is good, but it's not in the right time. We crave, we desire, we desperately want to be satisfied. And you might be listening to this now thinking my life isn't satisfying or it's full of little mini instant satisfactions that don't really amount to anything and just leaves me hungry for more and more. 
Well, unless God is our number one pursuit, unless God is our greatest affection, everything else will crowd him out and nothing else will satisfy. God has to be maximised in our lives and given his place in our lives as God. Not just when a family member is in hospital, not just when we're running into financial difficulties, not just when our health is at risk. God has to be at the centre and he has to be our greatest desire all the time. Otherwise we substitute him for other things that are less than good and we are dissatisfied. We have to learn to trust him and to love him. You might be equating some of this government imposed lockdown and quarantine to a kind of a wilderness experience. You might be looking back through rose tinted glasses at all the things you miss. But as believers, and if you're watching this today, then you're probably a believer or at least a seeker. I can tell you that there is real satisfaction to be found in God and in his son, Jesus Christ. Whenever we push God out, whenever we marginalise the power of Jesus in our lives and minimise that, then nothing else satisfies us. We are left feeling empty and we are left with our cravings never meeting our sense of needing to be satisfied. Emmanuel read from Psalm 34, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. It might not seem like the most exciting way to live. It may not have instant gratification like melons and cucumber and garlic, but it is manna from heaven. Perfect, satisfying and life-giving and freedom-leading. Tina read from John's Gospel where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And if you come to me, you will never be hungry. Imagine that. Imagine living a life where we are never again hungry or seeking all of those false satisfactions, false promises that the world seeks to offer us. You may have lost your way a little bit. Perhaps other things have crowded in. Perhaps you're pursuing other things. The call this morning is to come back to God. Remember him in the bad and remember him in the good. Learn to trust him. Learn to love him and know that his path and his way for you is one which will lead you to joy and freedom and a land of promise. In Numbers 11, God made graves for their craving. He judged them for it and ultimately he punished them for it. Because he understood that when they consistently craved other things and not him, they were making an idol of those other things. And he was no longer their number one. God will journey with us for so long. This is the day of grace, of course. But one day he will hold us to account. And if we want that true freedom on the other side, then he calls us back to himself. So for real joy, satisfaction, peace, affirmation, love and hope and all the promises of the Christian faith, God must be number one. Number one and above all else. As the old hymn lyric puts it, Now none but Christ can satisfy, none other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus find. So I wait for you, and so I wait for 
Jesus, you're all. 